morning. It's good to see everyone here again. Thanks for singing that song. That ties in perfectly with the things that I wanted to talk about today. If you still got your Bible open to the book of James, that's where we're going to, where we're going to be spending all of our time this morning uh, in the book of James. About a week ago, or sorry, about a month ago, um, we talked about a dichotomous choice when I was here. That's one in which you've got only two options. You can choose this or the other one. And in the Bible, we meet a classic dichotomy that is choose God or something else. And we looked at Joshua's proposition, choose today who you will serve to dive into that. The Bible also addresses the person who attempts to be undecided. The Bible addresses the person who wants to sit on both sides of the fence, right? Have one foot in one door and also in the other one to be in the world, but also with God. They can't fully make up their mind. Uh, this is the lukewarm person that's mentioned uh, in Revelation chapter 3 when the church in Laodicea is being cri uh, criticized. There it says in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. James also speaks to this person in chapter 1, verse 8. He refers to this person as a double-minded man, one that's unstable in all his ways. In the context there in, in James chapter 1, he's addressing this person, the double-minded person, regarding asking for wisdom in faith. And you see that in verses 5 and 6. If any, one of, uh, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God in verse 6, but he must ask of faith. Uh, and the person who doesn't is like a double-minded person. In context, the request for wisdom is clearly associated with having the ability to endure trials with patience. That's what James had been developed, has developed in verses 1 through 4. And so that's the context in which he suggests ask God for wisdom. The double-minded person is going to be completely unsuccessful in that attempt if they're double-minded, right? Because to be successful in enduring trials with patience, we have to be totally convicted and have our minds totally made up. Um, and he says in chapter 1, verse 7 there, that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. So I almost spoke on this double-minded man a little bit this morning, but I thought before that it might be necessary to more fully develop um, what James has talked about in verses 1 through 4. So that's where our lesson is going to be this morning. Um, trying to understand what trials look like for the Christian. How do we approach them? <clears throat> so in James chapter 1, verse 1, he starts off saying, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Uh, starts his letter off with a salutation. And within this first verse, we have the material that you would normally talk about for, you know, the introduction to a book. And I don't, we could spend a lot of time on this. Who was James? Who did he write to? And I do want to talk about it a little bit because the reason why it's important is once we understand who this James actually was and who he was writing to, it suddenly puts it into an historical context that lets us better understand what the readership would think whenever he says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. They had something come to mind when James spoke about trials, and I want to uh, demonstrate that for us this morning. So first of all, who was this James? In the New Testament, there are nine people mentioned who are named James, including James chapter 1, verse 1. The eight other ones are James, the son of Zebedee, who was an apostle, um, the brother of John, he was a fisherman. This is one of Jesus's inner circle, right? Um, Peter, James, and John were the only ones with Jesus at the Transfiguration when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter. And in the Garden in Gethsemane, only James, the son of Zebedee, along with his brother John and Peter, were there. He's a famous apostle. In Acts chapter 12, verse 2, we learn that Herod killed him. He was the first apostle ever died, uh, to, other than Judas Iscariot, uh, to be martyred. He was the first one. So he's a very famous James. The less famous one that was also an apostle is James, the son of Alphaeus. We've also got James, the brother of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, we learn that Jesus was the son of a carpenter. He was the son of Mary. And we also learn he had four brothers, half brothers. The oldest one was James. His other brothers were uh, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, or Jude. That'll be important for later. Uh, his brothers didn't always believe in him. 
In John chapter 7, verse 5, it says not even his brothers were believing in him. However, we do know that his brothers eventually were convinced that he was the Messiah once they saw their half-brother literally risen from the dead. So in Acts chapter 1, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, you've got this scene where everybody's praying, the apostles and a bunch of other people. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her, his brothers were there with him. And then finally, also in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, Paul is describing his first visit to Jerusalem. And he says, I only talked to two people, Peter, and he says, James, the Lord's brother, and he calls him an apostle there, which is interesting, right? So uh, an apostle is just one that was sent out, perhaps by Jesus, and he definitely saw Jesus post-ascension. So he was a believer eventually. We've also got James the Less. So there's, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, there's these list of women who are at the crucifixion. And in one of the accounts, it mentions James is the son of Mary. And then in one of the Gospels, it calls him James the Less. So it's not too far a leap to connect the two. So that's another James. There was an apostle, Thaddeus. His dad's name was James. Lots of James in the Bible, as it turns out. You've got James the leader. Now, if you just read the, the New Testament, starting in the Gospels all the way through to the end, you get to Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 15, and all of a sudden, there's this James that comes on the scene in a very strong way. So in Acts chapter 12, James, the son of Zebedee, has died. Peter gets arrested, and you remember all the people were praying for Peter, and then he miraculously escapes prison with the help of an angel of the Lord. And he comes back to the people, and they can't believe he's there, and he says, go and tell James and the brethren. So he mentions a James there. Now, whoever this James was is clearly a leader there in Jerusalem. It cannot be the son of Zebedee. He had already died. In Acts chapter 15, then, you've got the Jerusalem council. And um, this is where Paul and Barnabas come back to Jerusalem to describe their work amongst the Gentiles. And it says, once they describe it, two people spoke up. One was Peter. The other one was James. Again, could have been James, the son of Zebedee. Um, when Paul describes this event in Galatians chapter 2, he refers to James and Peter pillars. This guy was clearly a leader in the Jerusalem church. Um, when Paul talks about he opposed Peter to his face because he was acting one way when Jews were around and another way when they weren't, he refers to the men who were Jews as certain men from James, from Jerusalem. So I only bring this out to say that, you know, this James, whoever he was, was important enough that uh, Paul associated, you know, his mentees, the men who were from James, uh, when discussing this in Galatians chapter 2. So, you've got James the leader. There's also a James mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, who saw Jesus after the resurrection. This is when Paul says, you know, he appeared to Peter, and then the apostles, and then in verse uh, 6, I think it says, more than 500 people. And then in verse 7, it says, then he appeared to James and the apostles. And then there's one more. Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude verse 1 says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. So Jude had a brother, his name was James. Now then, some of these are the same James. So in all likelihood, James, the son of Alphaeus, the apostle, is also probably James the Less. I won't get into those details. It has to do with Mary being called the, uh, the husband of Cleopas, and you can connect some dots that way. Don't want to belabor the point. But I believe, and this is what most people think, that James the leader is the one that wrote James 1 1. And this is not too far a leap once you consider all the evidence. And it's very likely that the rest of these are the same James. I, I don't want to talk about this a ton, but I put verses up here and I'm happy to discuss it later um, with you afterwards, perhaps. But I do want to make the point that James the leader was very likely the brother of Jesus, who had a complete 180 degree conversion after seeing his brother risen from the dead, completely changed his life. He was a follower then, and you will see eventually he lost his life for the cause of Christ. Um, and Jude, also you remember Jesus had a brother named Jude. I think it's worth mentioning that when, they, when both of those people introduce themselves in their books, they don't call themselves the brother of Jesus. They call themselves a bondservant of our Lord Jesus Christ. To them, their blood relationship was far inferior to their being a servant of their Lord and, and Savior Jesus. Okay, now knowing this helps us better understand who he wrote to and uh, the circumstances that they were in. <clears throat> so let's next consider uh, who did he write to. It says there in James 1.1, 1, 1, 
to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, uh, colon space greetings, period. So the 12 tribes is definitely a Jewish red, um, reference. He's speaking to a Jewish audience. If you got time this afternoon, it takes about 13 minutes to read James. So I encourage you, read the book. Um, and you'll, if you pull out all the Old Testament references and concepts, you will see there are a ton. In chapter 2, verse 2, he mentions an assembly that's literally translated synagogue. In chapter 2, verse 8, he quotes Leviticus and refers to it as law. In chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he quotes two of the Ten Commandments and refers to them as law. In 2 and 21, he calls Abraham father. In uh, 21 and 22, he uses Abraham's offering of Isaac as a demonstration of faith and works, a demonstration of his faith through works. He does the same thing for Rahab from the book of Joshua in chapter 2 and 25. Um, in chapter 2 and 23, he quotes Genesis 15, 6. He refers to Abraham as a friend of God, which is the same language used in 1 Chronicles 20 and 7. And so my point is, just in chapter 2, there's tons of Old Testament references, and that's not to mention the references to the Old Testament prophets in chapter 5, Job in chapter 5, Elijah in chapter 5. This is clearly a Jewish audience. However, they're most definitely Jewish Christians. So um, in chapter 1, verse 1, he calls Jesus Lord. In chapter 2, verse 1, it's clear that he assumes the readership holds their faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 5, verse 7, his readers apparently were awaiting the coming of the Lord. So this is Jewish Christians that he's talking to. Finally, who are dispersed abroad. This is most definitely a reference to what happened after Acts chapter 7. You remember Stephen uh, gave that sermon. The Jewish opposition didn't like it. They stoned him to death. And immediately after that, in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says, All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And then same chapter, Acts 8 4, it says it refers to those who had been scattered. And then Acts chapter 11, verse 19, it says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. The point is, is that clearly there was this people fleeing Jerusalem because of the persecution, and that those people became referred to as the scattered, the dispersed. He's writing to these people now. <clears throat> So, this allows us to understand the historical context, finally. Once we've nailed down what James it is, who he was writing to, most people date this book to about A.D. 45 to 50. Okay, A.D. 50 is about when the Jerusalem Council was. It was most likely before that. Um, and so, you, it's important to understand, he's going to talk about trials. What did the people at the time deal with? Poverty was a big one. There was no middle class in Palestine in, in this time. There was no middle class. You were either elite or you were peasant. Um, some people refer to this as your classic peasant society. Um, the, uh, most people were peasants who lived in villages outside the city. And the cities, the big cities, were sort of uh, parasitic on the surrounding peasant villages. They would take advantage of them. This is a quote from an article by Hakkinen in 2016 called Poverty in the First Century Galilee. It says, the wealth and status of the elite families ensured their influence in politics so that they were able to control both local and regional governance and also profit from taxation. The point is this, the rich people were in charge and they did so with whatever they wanted to do and however it benefited them. And when, if you read James, you will see a ton of discussion about rich poor conflict and clearly James refers to the rich being uh, oppressive toward the poor. And so this was a, a thing that was happening a thing that they had to deal with. It would have been difficult times for the person who was not mainstream, which would have been the case for the Christian. Uh, natural disasters. So in Acts chapter 11, verse 28, you see a prediction of a famine that was supposed to happen in the time of Claudius. And there is a secular historian, Josephus, who actually recorded that this actually happened. Um, it happened during, uh, it hit Rome, Greece, and Egypt and Judea in about A.D. 45 to 48. That's, notice, that's when most people date the book of James. So there was famine, there's natural disasters. That might be what James is referring to, at least with some trials. But for sure, persecution for the cause of Christ. This was a big one. Um, Peter and John are imprisoned in Acts chapter 4, verse 3. The apostles are imprisoned again in Acts chapter 5, verse 18, and they're beaten in Acts 5 and 40. 
We saw Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. It says Paul ravaged the church and then commoners, men and women, were imprisoned in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by the sword, the first uh, apostle martyr. Peter was arrested right after that in Acts chapter 12, verse 3. We almost didn't have Paul to write Romans and the Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, all those wonderful books. Paul was almost stoned to death in Acts chapter 14, verse 19, and there was constant conspiracy to kill him. So Christians at the time were constantly dealing with these difficulties. And also James, the brother of Jesus, the person who very likely wrote this book, was stoned to death uh, because he was a Christian. Uh, Josephus wrote about this. It's an interesting story. I won't get into it. But uh, the high priest, when there was a power vacuum in the Roman, Roman uh, procurator, he immediately had James put to death, the very person who wrote this book. Okay, so it's within that context. Persecution for the cause of Christ, so severe, right? And sometimes we read it. We read about people being thrown in jail for, for Christianity. And it's sort of just, okay, okay, I get it. But I've never been to jail. I, I've never been imprisoned, right? Can, can you imagine being taken to, to prison this afternoon because we're worshiping here, because we call Jesus Lord? I mean... How, how would that interrupt your life, wouldn't it? S suddenly you can't go to work tomorrow? What's your boss? Where are you, Reed? You're not at work today. You're in a jail cell, and you go through all that process. Why? Because you call Jesus Lord, because you won't denounce your faith. It's within those circumstances. These people are fleeting. They've got all of this uncertainty. Don't know what troubles they're going to run into tomorrow. They're literally fearing for their life, for their own well-being, for the well-being of their family. Their world has been turned upside down. What would be the easy way out? Denounce your faith. They flee Jerusalem, and James writes them this letter, and here's what he has to say. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, it seems like a radical statement to make, given the circumstances. Um... But there's two really strong points that I want to make in this lesson. The first one is, there is a joy to consider in trials. And I want to elaborate a little bit on what that is. And the second one is that God does mean, God means for us to respond with patience. He intends and expects us to respond in a certain way every single time. Uh, first, from verse 2, notice he, he says... Um, Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, and you ask yourself, what various trials is he talking about? Well, we've already discussed some of the things that were going on at the time. He says various, meaning it's not, we can't necessarily say that it's one thing and not another. It's various, and so whatever principles and uh, suggestions James makes for dealing with trials, they are broadly applicable because it's various trials. Uh, but for sure, the dominant idea is persecution for Christians at the time. But you can look at what follows. In verse 3, he says, testing of your faith. When James is speaking about trials, he's talking about those things that test our faith. And we'll see later, if you read the book later, when he starts talking about general temptations to sin. In chapter 1, verse 12, all the way through uh, verse 18. Anything that tests our faith, anything that tests our patience is what James is referring to as a, tri a trial, especially in regards because of our loyalty to God. Um, but perhaps other things, right? Rich poor, he will discuss rich co rich poor conflict in also in chapter one in uh, in verses nine, ten, and eleven, and he'll do it later in the book as well. Perhaps famine, natural disasters, uh, physical suffering, illness, disease, cancer. I don't understand why this is happening to me. Anything that would make you doubt, you know, your, your faith in God. A test of your faith. This is what James is addressing. So, the two points. There is a joy to consider, and God means for us to respond with a patient attitude every single time. So, firstly, there is a joy to consider in trials. Verse 2 provides the answer. It says, or verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. That's supposed to bring us joy, knowing that. Uh, he says uh, it's, it's translated endurance in the New American Standard Bible. In the ESV, it's translated steadfastness. 
In the uh, NIV, it's translated perseverance, and in the King James Version, is patience. You get the idea of what he's talking about. We endure these trials, and the end result is that it teaches us patience, how to be steadfast, how to sustain, uh, how to persevere. For James, this idea is apparent. It's something that we should know, right? He starts off by saying, knowing that it does this. In the, in the ESV, it says, for you know. These are things that we ought to know. And so this joy is not a shallow, naive enthusiasm. It's not shallow. It's deep. And it comes with a deep understanding. So here is the order of understanding. First, we must recognize I need to lay my hands on patience. I've got to grab hold of this gem of a virtue. It's a pinnacle virtue. If we don't convince ourselves of step number one, then we don't need to go on to step number two. It starts here. Otherwise, this joy makes no sense because it is a radical statement. It's a radical statement. Consider it joy when you encounter various trials. It only makes sense if we have a deep understanding of the importance of patience. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 4, patience, we know, is a characteristic of godly love. 1 Corinthians 13 and 7, it says godly love endures all things. Jesus said that the one who endures to the end will be saved in Mark 13 and 13. So patience apparently is like a prerequisite characteristic for being the person that God intended for us to be. Once we recognize, I'm fully convinced I have to learn patience somehow, we understand next. Patience is learned when it is practiced, just like anything else, right? You only have opportunity to get better at something if you have opportunity to practice it. So we, we follow this, and then finally, it can be practiced only when it is tested, when we face these trials. Now, we can follow this understanding. This is why James can say, for you know that it produces endurance. But, I mean, it's easy for me to say it. The hard part is having this awareness in the midst of needing to display patience, right? And that takes prayer. That ta Well, I certainly don't do it all the time. It takes um, thinking about it, meditating about it, so that the word can finally become a filter that filters our natural response to a thing. <clears throat> the end result of practicing patience is, it says perfection or completion. The word there means spiritual maturity. It's the difference between a babe in Christ versus a fully grown, seasoned, experienced adult in Christ. That's what patience does for a person. Its end result is to perfect us in that way, to mature us spiritually. The same word that's translated perfect here is used by Paul in Colossians 1.28, and there it's translated complete. That verse reads, we proclaim him, talking about Jesus, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That word complete there could be uh, so that we may present every man perfect in Christ. It's not perfect like you, you, you know, when I'm, when I'm 80, I won't sin anymore. That's not the idea. It's that you mature spiritually. Um, James says that's the end result of practicing patience. Paul says that's the end result of learning wisdom. The point I'm making is that clearly there's an association between godly wisdom, biblical wisdom, and the ability to endure trials with patience. It's for this reason that James, right after making this point, says, if you lack wisdom, pray for it. In James chapter 1, verse 5. That's the connection. He's talking about asking wisdom so that you can respond to trials in the way that God would have us to. So knowing this on, up front... Knowing this now, convincing ourselves of it and the value of patience allows us finally to agree with the radical statement, consider it joy. When we, when we meet trials, we understand, here's an opportunity for me to grow. It's not necessarily a circumstance that we want to be in every time. Especially when trials come from loved ones hurting us, perhaps, losing a loved one. It's not something we'd rather be in, but God does expect us to treat malignant conditions in a certain way. We know that we cannot mat fully mature any other way. Now, there is another joy that the Christian always can point to, and that is this hope that we have. It's not necessarily connected with the joy to learn patience, but James will talk about this too, also in, in chapter 1 and verse 12. 
He says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And at the end of the book, he'll conclude in chapter 5, verse 8, be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. All Christians can point to the future coming of Jesus. We know how this game is going to end. We know what the end result is, is going to be. The victory has already been won. Second point, and then the lesson will be yours. God means for us to respond with patience. He expects this. Uh, this is implied in James here, chapter 1. It's an implication. However, it's also supported in, a, in other scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? It's a rhetorical question. He's saying you can't point to yourself and say, look, I'm enduring with patience whenever you brought the trial on yourself for being evil to someone else. But, he says, if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. When we're persecuted for decisions that we've made, when we find difficulty in our lives because we choose to do something that's different from the worldly wisdom because we follow a biblical wisdom, that might bring difficult times on us. And Peter says, when you approach those situations with patience, this finds favor with God. So we know this now. We've now been convinced of this from the word of God. And this now ought to weigh on our conscience what the right thing to do is. If you happen to, I didn't put this on the board, uh, but 1 Peter is the next book after James. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19... He uses this argument of conscience to motivate his people there right before, right before making this point in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and 19, he says, This finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. He's saying there is motivation for a person for the sake of their conscience toward God. For the sake of recognizing there's a certain way I know I ought to behave. And I ought to bear up under these less than ideal circumstances patiently. And, you know, this pointing to our conscience in this way is synergistic with James saying, for you know, you know that this teaches you endurance. How else could we respond? This is not, you know, a patient response is not exactly fleshly. It's not exactly how lions respond when they're, uh, you know, tempted. And we have certain animal-like instincts to respond when presented with certain impulses, to just say things that are hurtful, to just act in harmful and violent ways. And so the worldly response when, when approached with less than ideal circumstances might be to complain. James addresses this in chapter 5. And verse 9, where he says, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. We could blame others, which leads to quarrels. And so maybe this has something to do with why James brings up what he says in James chapter 4 and verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your, uh, is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? We could blame God. And so James addresses this in James chapter 1 and verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. And he goes on to explain that any evil and wickedness that we find in ourselves, it originated within us. And it starts with the lust of the flesh, and that's contrasted, it ends in spiritual death. And that's contrasted with the source of spiritual life, which is ultimately God. Right? That's what he says in verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift comes from God, uh, from the Father above. And finally, the other way that we could respond is denounce our faith. And so James finishes his book in chapter 5, 7, and 8 saying, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. I wanted to look at an example, and then we'll finish up. An example in Joseph. This is uh, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Uh, it's this example why I use the word means here. Because in 
that word is used in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, where speaking to his brothers, Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Um, was what Joseph went through as a result of his brother's actions, was that a trial? Sure it was. Tested his patience. And we see insight into how Joseph approached those problems. The word that's translated meant there comes from the Hebrew word kashab, and it has two definitions, two different meanings. The first is to plot, to devise a plan, to contrive. The second one is to consider a thing a certain way, to count a thing, to reckon a thing a certain way. And in this one verse, you see the same word taking on both meanings. His brothers meant evil in the sense that they planned it, they strategically devised their plot and contrived their plan, and they executed to make sure that they got rid of them. God, on the other hand, I don't believe, took, a, took away his brothers' free will to make them do that. He didn't force them to do it. When it says God meant it for good, it's in that second definition of that Hebrew word, kashab. He considered it. Joseph, you've found yourself in these less than ideal circumstances. It's an opportunity for good. Count it as a way to produce something good. Reckon it that way. Joseph seems to have um, taken this approach. He, his approach seems to be whatever circumstances I find, my in, find myself in. We're only here for a little bit. James will talk about that in James chapter 4. Life's a vapor. Only here for a little bit. Whatever circumstances I find myself in. I will use it as an opportunity for God, to the best of my ability. One commentator says, uh, Joseph's rationale rests on the idea that the malignant intentions of men can realize the benign intentions of God. And we ought to have the same attitude. We understand that it finds uh, favor with God. In closing, our greatest example is in our God and our Savior. We talked earlier about that word perfect means spiritual maturity. Reminds me of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 40, 48. It says, you be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That comes right after Matthew, a discussion in Matthew 5, 44, where he says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. It takes patience so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And it's then that he says, therefore, you be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Therefore, in these unideal circumstances, when you meet persecution, when you face trials, bear up and suffer it with patience so that you can show love to these people. And he says, as your heavenly father is perfect. Which puts that in a certain context. God has been infinitely patient toward his creation, toward us, toward me. It was demonstrated this morning in the Lord's Supper talk. My sin put him on the cross. And God has been infinitely patient with us and gracious with us in giving his own son to pay for our sin. It's a strong reminder. And then finally also Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, but we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus had his patience tested, he had his faith tested, and he gave us the perfect example, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, so he kept silent, is the example we have in Isaiah 53. So this morning, I want to encourage you to be resolved to take on this attitude. It's not easy, but we understand it finds favor with God. It's one that we can agree with when we attempt to have a deep understanding of where it comes from and we, why we ought to pursue it. When we are presented with impulses that would otherwise move us to respond with impatience and just blurt things out that hurt people, filter those responses with the Word of God. His Word, His counsel is supreme. So we've got to be aware, looking for those opportunities, be ready in those opportunities, to uh, mature spiritually, to be complete in that sense, we understand this finds favor with God. Jesus was our ultimate example. 
And if you're trying to do this thing, if you're trying to get through life without him, you're fighting an uphill battle. You were designed a certain way. God made us in his image. He knows us. He knows our blueprint better than anyone. And we need his spirit to operate the way that we're intended to operate. And we need Jesus for this. We're fighting an uphill battle without him. And Jesus is pleading with us to follow him, commit your life to him. He's already done the hard part. The victory has won. It's, it's, it's your choice. Commit your life to him. Repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed. If you're sitting there and wondering, I plead with you, don't wait another day. There's eternal consequences at stake. We can be with God forever or we can be separated from God for eternity. Don't wait another day. Talk to someone. Um, I hope this message has been encouraging for you this morning. Uh, let's think about these things as we sing our song.